Hey guys, Francis. Fascinating little uh, dinner. My little Rachel has just uh, served up some stuffed peppers, vegetarian style. At all of 13 years old, she's at her fifth week of eating vegetarian. And so I was fed most nicely. Uh, anyway, I want, to I want to talk to you about something I haven't touched in a while. Um, and the politics and what, what history teaches you. And I, I'm having to gap fill history. I'm really, you know, I don't have all my history. Um, and things that I should know, I, I don't know. Um, anyway, so going through the history of World War One, World War One. Now, World War One involved uh, Austria, Hungary, Germany, um, and then France, England, uh, Belgium, all to the Western Front, um, and right at the end, uh, America, and to the Eastern Front, Romania, Russia. Uh, and it's fascinating because it was a very tumultuous period for Russia and they'd had a revolution and then they were to suffer the revolution of Lenin and uh, September 17 Lenin um, led a second revolution which I think was always planned and always part of it and it wasn't just his master plan I think he was being guided and I'll talk more on that the under the under forces, the dark government behind that. So he was the front man um, for all of this. And what, what he did is he had a debate with all his Bolshevik heads and he decided a second uh, revolution very shortly after a previous one um, when Russia had become a republic after ousting the Tsars. He thought, let's strike while the iron's hot. Russia was in weak state economically. Um, very dispersed and was fighting a war now on the Eastern Front with the, the omnipotent uh, force, which was the combination of both Germany and then of, at those days, a very strong Austro-Hungarian that also had the Southern Slavic nations, which were yet to break away under their hold. So you've got to think of all of all of that as how big the Austro-Hungarian Empire was. Anyway, it's a little bit of history gapful for me and maybe for some of you too. Maybe a lot of you know this better than me. Um, but the interesting thing about this is so Lenin went for an almost bloodless, succeeded an almost bloodless um, second revolution. And the first things that the Bolsheviks did is they took control. And this is your lesson for the future. Telegraph stations, power stations, strategic bridges, post offices, train stations, and state banks. State banks. So this is when people that are under dark government control and are at a critical state where they are exhausted in every sense, financially, can't build military power anymore, um, needed financial help from the French, no less, to rebuild infrastructure, um, a turmoil, citizen unrest, etc., these are the pressure points to go for. Telegraph stations is communications. The modern day equivalent will be your internet hubs and your mobile network. The post offices, the same. You used to go there to send telegraphs and to send mail. This was communication. So just read the latter day communication hubs and think about what those would be today. Um, power stations, grid down, you keep people wondering what the hell's going on, they can't switch lights on, they can't organize during the night, they're trying to find candles, they don't know how to boil a kettle. You keep people fast in, in an absolute dual, just trying to deal with day-to-day -day things when you take a grid down, a power grid down. Everyone is reliant on electricity. This is fascinating. And this is for your future scenario casting of an omni-vulnerable state globally, how things could play out. Um, so those were all taken down and the banks, the money, the money. You control the money and the media. And that was largely done without gunfire or any uh, media. There was just the one winter palace, which they actually marched on, which was the only holdouts um, on the evening of uh, whenever it was, November the 7th, back in 1917. Um, and they, they almost completed an entirely bloodless coup, um, the Bolsheviks. Uh, and under Trotsky, untold murder was uh, put into place. The only white Russians that had a success story were actually Finns. And Finland gained its independence as the white Russians, as they beat off the Red Russians in that part and seceded from that then Russian Empire. Fascinating, fascinating for what comes. And this is all during 
um, the World War uh, One. And uh, so it was white versus red Russians later to become the USSR under the red Russians that won most places. And they attacked Ukraine, um, which had white Russian and anti-Bolshevik uh, forces, which were largely Khazarian and largely Judaic in faith, uh, the red Russians. And the eventual terrible deal that led to the seeding of World War II was the Treaty of Versailles, um, which came out of the eventual uh, settling of World War I and had huge reparations due to France, who was, who was um, primed as main victim, Battle of the Somme, sort of Belgium into France, sort of in between Paris and Strasbourg, right on the border of France in the old Alsace-Lorraine contentious area that was once deemed Germany, then, then deemed French and very virulently French. Um, and my mother comes from that area right the way to uh, Paris. So you had that Somme line, the Trent, that's where real Trent Wall for it. The Eastern Front was so big, ran all the way from St. Petersburg in Russia, all the way down, right down to the Black Sea, Odessa, Ukraine, right the way through there with every Romania, Bulgaria, the, the Southern Slavic nations, everything. <sighs> So it was huge. There was no trench warfare. The, the, the war line was too big. Um, but anyway, what was fascinating about that Treaty of Versailles signed in the castle of Versailles, Rothschild owned and supervised. And that is where you seeded the next war by over-indebting the perceived loser of the, the previous one, World War One, And I repeat again to those of you that um, here in the UK, that in uh, 2014, roughly on a 100-year anniversary, the King of England's mail to um, the Secretary of State um, was find a reason to go to war when he stated, we do not have a reason to commence war with Germany. This man was told find a reason by the then King of Britain. And I put it to you that both the, the, the then Tsar, who was cousins with the King and monarchy of England, had decided and agreed that the Kaiser, um, a third also a cousin, and this was essentially a family feud, um, was getting too powerful and needed taking down. Um, and that is, uh, you know, that is essentially a family feud which got funded by banker money where the deals were hosted and finalized and the treaties under the auspices of the Rothschild clan um, in their own castle that they owned. Um, and the key point is this the Russian state was absolutely flattened. And let me also make a point that Russian propaganda and how they utilized and they also highlight Russian, everybody was doing it. German, everybody else was very active part of the warfare during that period, utilizing stereotypes of the dominance of Germans, etc. And how POWs were being badly treated, etc. And I'm sure it was vice versa being done. But if you think that just the triggering event, the final straw is just... Austria-Hungary's declaring of war on Serbia when Archduke Ferdinand was shot was the main reason for the war. That was that is, I'm afraid, you'll t take any line that we were setting up for war. The war was coming. Kings and czars had decided it needed to happen. There was an escalation of tensions, intentionally engineered. There was failure in diplomacy, intentionally engineered. And then there was sought a final excuse event. And it could have been anything. If you want war, you will get it. And the militarization and, and the dark forces certainly did want that. Uh, and it shook and it shook the whole. And then the, the reason behind the socialism and the red socialism was the argument. And listen to this where we've heard it said before. Learn. They said socialism is good. Socialism and one of the key thrusts of socialism is to ensure that we never face war like this again. It is these capitalist tendencies and war. We implement socialism. All free individual land rights were confiscated. When the Reds took over, state took all assets and it was all for you, the worker. Now, I want you to think about today when you hear about all this basic minimum wage for everybody globally being floated. I want you to see it for potentially what it is. It sounds awesome. Hey, somebody's just going to pay me. Where does that money come from? 
How is it going to affect you? How are you paying for this? There is no free lunch. They will take all your power and your assets from you on the basis that government is the final provider and give them the final power. And I believe we're facing a second stand of communism. And if you project this, that one of the scenarios that I will play out, and I don't, this isn't a forecast, this is me scenario casting. It could be wrong on many levels and I invest no ego on it being right or wrong. And in many instances, I hope to be wrong. So don't fool this with a forecast. Trump is coming in as the last bastion of capitalism and nationalism. If we have the full-blown debt reset, the damage and the fallout that will be far vaster than 20809 because we never really dealt with the problems. That was a tremor for the main earthquake that needs to come. We have 216 trillion in debt globally now. We have to pile up so much more debt to get a single pip in GDP that we're into deep into the end zone of diminishing returns. So the game becomes we need a reset. It's been engineered that this has happened and they have tipped the table so that the people that knew what was coming were positioned to make all the money on the upside on all of this. Then what happens is you punish and you blame on capitalism. The control of the narrative will be saying failure in capitalism. Minimum wage for all, government control for everything. Your privacy is already being invaded. Your banking, your emails are scanned. They have the information. They are already shadow controlling in terms of who markets to you. It's the same oligarch companies that don't face antitrust law. Google, Apple, the US tech big boys. And what happens in all of this? When we have our reset on the debt side during, say, for example, the Trump presidency, who has been pushed back on globalization, pushed back on government intervention that is meant to be the banner boy, yet largely hated and seen by the mainstream media, the answer becomes you see what you've done when the reset happens on him. The problems with debt were seeded, seeded presidents and presidents and presidents ago right from the boom in the 80s. They need a fall guy, and that fall guy is engineered to be the banner holder for capitalism so that the entire system has failed and we say we are doing it different this time. In the same way the Bolsheviks came when the country was desperate and on its knees and being mismanaged and led to war and indebted. Communism. So that we never need fight wars again. By that story. Buy that story. And here's your basic wage. We'll make sure everyone gets paid the same. Think about that when you hear about minimum um, wages. And they go test pilot these things in the Scandinavian countries and say how awesome it's all working out. Countries that have a bequest like Norway of oil coming out of their ears. You think it's going to work in Norway like in the rest of the world? The same? Do you think you aren't going to be giving up immense control if someone then becomes your backstop payer? Do you think prices won't go up that that minimum grinding wage is not going to see bracket creep in terms of potential purchasing power and diminished purchasing power? You're put on a an earn that goes up at 1% and you're told inflation is no more than 1% when you find it's 5 or 6%. Your rights to private capital are diminished and undermined by an all-reaching techno-octopus that reaches into every crevasse of exchange that you have by trade barter of any kind, whether it's PayPal, Bitcoin. They own the power grid, they own the web, they own everything that they do. They even have their Trojans in your antivirus software to know what you think you're trying to hide from them. Fascinating. Is he to be the fall guy for the final bastion of self-determination before everybody else and everybody gets sold after a major conflict so that we never have to face this conflict again? How is that narrative being used so many times? In World War I, it's used to flip the, the nation state of Russia into socialist Marxist eventual full communism. And we hear it again for the implementation of the EU and the socialist governments that have existed there, that have brought us the EU state to this point of indebtedness again that Russia was in 
when it couldn't even modernize its own infrastructure, it had no money, and it was beholden to the bankers that were there lending out their prime property for treaties of global significance to be signed. Therein was your dark hand who engineered the entire situation. And where are we now? Where are we now? Think hard about where are we now? Your equity, the most hated bull run by the man in the street who has never felt it in his pocket, never felt the recovery in what was actually a Great Depression-like environment from 06, 07, that should have begun in the dot-com bust. You have your equity markets at 1999 valuations and bond markets at all-time highs starting from a cycle in the early 80s that has not turned back yet with the first signs of pullbacks being now monetary policy being ever extended and the global expectation on all the major nations is ongoing sustained low interest rates indefinitely how can you be led to believe that unless you accept that monetary policy tool is entirely defunct because when it turns it will turn and it will shock you all and all the escalations in potential conflicts that any number of fronts could be a global war. If you don't see the signs of what must have been the existence and the, the environment in outdated infrastructure Russia on its knees, facing revolution after revolution and then a war, and the narratives that you were spun about how it will be different, you need this remedy, and to make sure we never face war again, we take down these capitalist nations that have this war-mongering tendency. We won't be that. It's fascinating. Your history is fascinating. And the more I go back and gap full, the more I see parallels between where we were then at those tumultuous times and where we are potentially today. Sobering thoughts. But for the man who prepares... The man who prepares the relative wealth can go off the chart. It's got to involve gold. Uh, it's got to involve silver. Under your physical control, under no vaults at all. And they may even nullify our cash hoarders. There is talk in the Fed, as a final point to leave you with, of printing up new notes in new colors in dollars and turning every other announcing on the spur of the moment here are the new notes. All notes before this are now deemed null and void. So have some cash for the tremors. Don't expect it to defend you necessarily. They have a plan for how they will nullify you. Remember, it's a piece of paper. That's a promissory note. They can write them down and say they ain't worth anything anymore. Here's your new money. You saw what they did in India on 80% of the circulation money. They are draft drilling these things to see how people are reacting under our noses with certain nation states. Some of them the biggest gold buyers in existence. Do you think, do you not think that it's stymied gold purchases? Go look at the effect of taking all that cash, that hot cash, and it's mainly peasants and small families that are inversely disproportionately affected by this. Go see what it did for gold purchases in India and tell me that wasn't part of the plan. Backed by Gates Foundation, the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, every major organization that you will consider as part of the dark government if you have any sense. Make you think. They've already done it. So wait for it to happen on the dollar. And then suddenly a proliferation of brand new notes, new heads on it. This is who you are. You may get time to take your old notes in. You may not. Uh, if you bring in too much money, you may get a tax inquiry. Who knows what they... Well, you may not have any time at all. They'll just be de declared null and void. Who knows what they could do? Um, but watch it. Watch it. Cash is king until it isn't. They can break the rules. It's their paper. So keep some. But let your bigger holding be in your silver and gold. That's Francis's Saturday night musing. Careful out there. There's a game to be won. Watch what they're doing. Stack your silver and your gold. Keep it off grid. 
and watch read your history and learn hope you found this enjoyable